This house to be sold, the property of the late William Shakespeare, inquire within. The auctioneer, Mr. Robbins, then stated his desire that the bidding should commence and 1,500 guineas were immediately offered. This was then followed by an offer of £2,000, after which 2,100 was bid. A letter was then handed to Mr. Robbins by Mr. Peter Cunningham as treasurer of the Stratford and London Shakespeare Committees, offering £3,000. Mr. Robbins then said that the trustees had just authorised him to state that he would not use his privilege of bidding after the offer which had been made, and the property was then knocked down to the Stratford and London Shakespeare Committees for £3,000 amidst immense cheering. <laughs> that is a report from the Illustrated London News of the 18th of September, 1847. My name's Paul Edmondson, I'm Head of Research here at the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, and I'm joined by Dr Charlotte Matheson of the University of Warwick, a Dickens expert, and our honorary president, Professor Stanley Wells. We're here in Shakespeare's birthplace, and the story we'd like to tell is Charles Dickens' connection, not only with this house and Stratford-upon-Avon, but with Shakespeare more generally throughout his work. Dickens first visited Shakespeare's birthplace in 1838, and in front of me is one of the early visitors' books with his name in it. He signed across the top part of the left-hand page. Charlotte, 1838 is a really important year for Dickens. Can you tell us why? Yes, well, Dickens had a lifelong interest in Shakespeare right from his earliest years, but 1838 was a very important year because Dickens visited the area. He stayed in Leamington and he went to Warwick and also Kenilworth and then came on to a visit in Stratford and came here to Shakespeare's house itself. Now, he writes about Leamington and Warwick in... His later novel, Dombey and Son, okay. and he writes at some length about that visit, um, but it's actually in his earlier work, Nicholas Nickleby, that he recounts the visit to this room itself. And of course, in his his letters of 1838 he notes coming and he says he sat in that dear little room and we signed our name in the great book which we've got here before us and then the year after um, in Nicholas Nickleby he recounts this through his characters and there's a, a conversation about um, Shakespeare and Mrs Whittisley claiming I'm always ill after Shakespeare I scarcely exist the next day I find the reaction so very great after a tragedy so sort of satirizing here the effect that Shakespeare might have on one's soul um, but then she she goes on to talk, you know, I find I take so much more interest in his plays after having been to that dear little dull house he was born in. And she asks, were you ever there, my lord? No, never. Oh, you really ought to go, my lord. I don't know how it is, but after you've seen the place and written your name in the little book, somehow or other you seem to be inspired. It kindles up quite a fire within one. And they sort of go on and her husband disputes this and says, no, no, my dear, it's just your poetical temperament, um, your ethereal soul, your fervid imagination, which throws you into a glow of genius and excitement. There is nothing in the place, my dear, nothing, nothing. But in fact, they go on and, Mick, and Mrs. Nickleby also um, claims that she felt something in this place and that she was in the family way with her son and was quite worried he might even turn out to be a Shakespeare himself, <laughs> whatever that might mean. So the sort of discussion around the effects... Um, um, Dickens obviously being quite satirical here. Sure. But in fact, you know, I think it did have an effect on him to see the place and, that, that and to be here. That fire is interesting, isn't it? Yes, the fire within one. one what, yeah. I mean, what does that mean for Dickens, would you say, throughout his career, really? I mean, um, Shakespeare's influence on Dickens is very apparent in all of his works. There are multiple references, quotations, just sort of slipped in here and there. Hamlet and Macbeth appear most frequently, so we have a lot of direct quotations. And one of the important things about this, I think, is that both Shakespeare and Dickens have quite an effect on the English language and Dickens is showing that Shakespeare is already sort of ingrained into his own use of language which in turn has kind of shaped our use of the English language today. So there's a sort of continuity there in terms of language usage but we might also think about some of the wider resonances as well. There's certainly a lot of structural and thematic uses of Shakespeare. Um, so we might think for example of the influence of plays such as King Lear. Dickens' lifelong interest in father-daughter relationships often models itself on Lear and Cordelia, um, and particularly in novels such as Dombey and Son, The Old Curiosity Shop. And, and Little Dorrit. Little Dorrit, absolutely. That's one so of your favourites. Yes, yeah, so in Little Dorrit we have, um, again, the King Lear and Cordelia relationship modelled in Dorrit and his daughter oh. Amy Dorrit, and the sort of the figure of the patriarchal um, father figure who comes into wealth, who's two, um, two older children, 
sort of throw themselves into this lavish lifestyle. His youngest daughter stays faithful to her true love for her father, and he's sort of blind to that, mm -hmm. and right until the end that continues. And this sort of interest in the father-daughter relationship really kind of sparked there, I think, and modelling itself on Shakespeare. But then there's also a lot of other influences, just in terms of Dickens as a writer in general. Of course, Dickens's familiarity with Shakespeare was as a playwright, not mm. as just the writer of words on a page, but he was very involved in Victorian theatre and theatricals more generally. And I think this really shows in Dickens's characterisation. And Dickens did, in fact, say at one point, you know, every writer is to some degree a writer of drama. Even when he writes fiction, he's writing for the stage. And I think we see this in his vivid characterisation and sort of larger than life figures and the way he sets up scenes as well. So, this sense of Shakespeare as a dramatist is really important. Really important to yeah. him. Stanley, this is in, important to you. It's one of your interests. How, how we can perhaps find out about theatre history yes. through the work of Dickens. Yeah, well, Dickens related very closely to the theatre, of course. He wanted to be an actor. He, he was going to audition for an act to be an actor, but then he was ill on the day of the audition, so he couldn't do it. But he retained his enormous interest. And one of his closest friends was the great Shakespeare actor William Charles McCready, uh, with whom he had a great deal to do. Uh, and his interest in theatre shows itself not only in the novels, but also in some of his journalism, especially mm. in the sketches from bars, for example. Well, there's a lovely piece about private theatres. There's a delightful theater. piece about the private theatres uh, where he talks about parts. people actually played parts. Of course, it cost you two guineas, I think it is, to play Richard III, <laughs> whereas you played Buckingham for a pound <laughs> and other parts for considerably less. And that is echoed in. Uh, in one of the novels, in Great Expectations, mm -hmm. where you get Mr. Wopsle, the uh, country schoolmaster who comes to London with ambitions to be an actor, and who p plays Hamlet, which no doubt he's probably paid about five pounds <laughs> for, in a private theatre. May I read you a little bit of yes, the description sure. Please, yeah. of Mr. Wopsle playing? This is from Great Expectation. Great Expectation. And Pip goes to see Mr. Wopsle, uh, very embarrassed by him, but very kindly disposed towards him as well. And he describes how, uh, describes a bit here about the to be or not to be soliloquy. Whenever that undecided prince had to ask a question or state a doubt, the public helped him out with it. As, for example, on the question whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer, some roared yes, and some no. And some, inclining to both opinions, said, toss up for it. And quite a debating society arose. When he asked, what should such fellows as he do, crawling between earth and heaven, he was encouraged with loud cries of, hear, hear. And when he recommended the player not to saw the air, thus, a sulky man said, and don't you do it, neither. You're a deal worse than him. And I grieve to add that peals of laughter greeted Mr. Wopsle <laughs> on every one of these occasions. Poor Mr. Wopsle. It's a marvellous passage. Yeah. Afterwards, Pip goes to see him uh, and tries to get out of having to praise him, but uh, it's all very embarrassing for poor Pip going to see his friend do this. Well, I mean, the the theatre runs through Dickens' Yes. There's a lovely book by Simon Callow, which was published earlier this year. Yes, Simon Callow has recently published a really en entrancing book called Dickens and the Theatre of the World. Uh, in, in which he talks about Dickens fairly generally, but also with a very special emphasis on his Shakespearean interest. Uh, Dickens himself was a, a sort of Shakespearean character, I think. He had that sort of flamboyance. Uh, the, uh, he loved performing, mm -hmm. and he goes around the country, of course, performing, and also he loved arranging theatricals mm -hmm. yes. and directing performances himself. Well, I mean, that's part of the story of the, of the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust in its early days, because that £3,000, which we read about earlier in the Illustrated London News, they were actually £1,400 short. Yes. So there's plenty of amateur performances taking place to try and recoup that £1,400. Yeah. But in addition to that, once that money was met, um, Charles Dickens himself puts on performances of uh, Julius Caesar, The Merry Wives of Windsor, um, and ben Johnson's Every Man in His Humour. And you, you have a letter there, Stanley. Yes, I have. It's a fascinating letter. Dickens was particularly interested in helping, interestingly, an old playwright, Sheridan Knowles, who, was, who had fallen on bad times. It was part of him that he put on these performances of the Ben Johnson's play. <coughs> and this is a letter which we have in our collections here. It's rather exciting, really, just to touch <laughs> paper which Dickens wrote <laughs> on. A letter to one of the people who was acting in the play. Uh, it's written in from Broadstairs, where Dickens was living at the time, it's in 1847, and he says, not knowing your address, 
I wrote to Mr. Forster, that's the great E.W. E. Forster, who, uh, who wrote a life of Dickens after mm -hmm. Dickens had died. Um, I wrote to him, begging him to write to you and say that I'd sent round the first rehearsal call for the man in his humour. Uh, and he gives the date and tells them about the arrangements. Also, that I'd summoned the whole company. It's all quite practical. He was, he was very much concerned with the practical details of performance. Mm -hmm. And he talk, talk, tells about how he'd arranged for them to meet. He says they must be well prepared in advance because they hadn't got much rehearsal time. Uh, and he ends by saying, we should have penthouses. I suppose that means rather posh accommodation. <laughs> uh, I, I have no doubt. And a pleasant expedition. They had quite a bit of fun behind the scenes, I'm sure. And then the letter is signed with that very characteristic signature, Charles Dickens with a great squiggle underneath. When's it, it dated, uh, It's It's dated the 6th of July, 1847. So it's a couple of months mm. before the purchase of the birthplace. Ah, yes. So maybe that was to raise money for the birthplace initially. But then actually, although the birthplace was short of money, the 1,400 yeah. and Dickens was on the, the committee, it does turn into raising money for a curatorship of the birthplace for his friend Sheridan Knowles. Yeah. 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 And we've got, the, we've got the playbills here for those performances, and you can see what parts uh, Dickens played. In quite a distinguished company, too. Various people, like uh, people who, who wrote for Punch, the, the satirical mm -hmm. magazine, uh, late, um, a, a lady called Mrs. Gooden Clark, who was a considerable Shakespeare scholar. She wrote the first Shakespeare concordance. And were, so these people, these very talented people, were willing to. Uh, well, make fools in the world, obviously. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot bigger part, mainly, of course, because it was Dickens who was inspiring them. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, he really had that pulling power amongst the yes, society, did, didn't yes. he? And yeah. He had immense energy, immense physical as well as intellectual energy, Absolutely, didn't Absolutely, yes. And it's well noted that this production of Mary Wives, you know, he really threw himself into the yes. production. And he was directing and producing and set designing, really pulling everything together. And it's sort of his moments really kind of shine and bring himself into the light. And I think Dickens loved being in the limelight, but also sort of pulling everyone else together as well. Yeah. Yes, in this case he was working with a company, but of course later in his life especially, he put on all these one-man shows, which practically killed him. The energy that he put into those, the, mm. the, the, exor the physical exhaustion, uh, which is well described by Simon Callow in his book, for yeah. example, about how he had to uh, break down during the intervals. Mm. And of course, eventually, it could be said it killed him, the, the physical energy. Yes, and these readings were interesting. When he toured the country in his later years, giving yeah. readings that from his play, from his novel, but he was never just sort of reading them as they were. No, he was always no. adapting and yes, giving little yes. theatrical twists or developing yeah. things. So again, I think the idea of adaptation, and obviously Shakespeare was greatly adapted in the Victorian period and the performances yeah, were always slightly yeah, altered. Yeah. And Dickens himself also adapting his own works, mm -hmm. not being too precious about you know, mm -hmm. what's there, but actually seeing the potential for something more to come out of it's, it. It's a good thought. and I mean, we recognise that he had to make money from them. Yes. But we recognise also probably that he was promoting his work but that he really just genuinely loved it. Enjoyed it, yes. Sure, he just, yes. he just fed upon that sense of reading in public. Absolutely. The relationship yes. with the audience was enormously yeah. important yeah. to him. He was a yeah. great populist in that way. Now, in yes. 1864, the tercentenary of Shakespeare's mm. birth is celebrated in Stratford, and there's some attempt... Dickens comes again to the town, he sees a performance of, tw of Twelfth Night, yes. um, and there's some attempt to get together another fund to put up a statue of Shakespeare mm. in the town. Um, and I think Dickens is a bit, a, bit, a bit wary of that. Yes, he was quite ambivalent about this, really. And he kept, um, he said that, you know, Shakespeare's best monument is his works right, themselves. Yeah. And I think that was really more important to him, that there wasn't a need for a sort of memorial as such. Yes. But it's interesting, actually, when we then consider the effort he'd previously put into buying Shakespeare's house, um, that he then sees that as enough in itself. I, I think he saw this as Shakespeare's best memorial. This is it, this, yes. This yes. Is yes. It. yes. Yes, this I'm sure that's yes. true. Yes. 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 Uh, but it's interesting that a few years later, in, in 1879, there opened the Royal Shakespeare Theatre. Yes. Um, the Shakespeare Memorial Theatre, as it was then called. So yes. that, that word memorial, yes. as if it's kind of almost yeah. been born. Taking over from the Dickens. sense of yeah. Yeah. From the works. Yeah. And sadly, the works Dickens well would never life. have seen that yeah. himself, of course. But yes, just a few yeah. years later, um, that would have been, would have been there. So. Well, Charlotte and Stanley, thank you ever so much. And thank you, Charles Dickens in your bicentenary year <laughs> on behalf we of the shouldn't be here without on you. On behalf <laughs> of the birthplace. <laughs>